What's a story that you've heard that still gives you chills to this day? Story 1. These are two of the most chilling and disturbing comments that I've seen in Rask Reddit since I made my account. A Redditor's story of how he dated a female sociopath. I read this story when I was new to Reddit, and it's still one of the most chilling things that I've ever read anywhere. The infamous comment by you serial underscore rapist underscore thread in the Ask a Rapist thread from one year ago. This thread has since been removed and had many of its comments scrubbed, yet it was easily one of Reddit's most infamous post threads of all time. The original comment was scrubbed, but I found it on this. I found the comment in the actual thread, and some of the replies are still there to read, while some of the better replies have also been scrubbed. A girl's response to the rapist's comment made Arbestoff, and here is the thread from Arbestoff. Story 2. Pardon my lack of knowledge on this event, as I have not researched it, but a ship capsized in the Atlantic Ocean not too long ago, assuming it wasn't very deep where they went down, probably off the coast of somewhere, and three days later, they send a diving team to recover bodies. They see something moving in the dark and shine a light to reveal the cook. Alive. Breathing through air trapped in the overturned boat. He had survived three days in there, and when they got him out and recovered, he told them it was pitch black and silent. Except he could hear the fish eating the rest of the crew. Story 3. So when I was 13, 26 now, my mom was dying of a form of liver cancer. We would talk for hours about what is heaven going to be like, etc. I asked her what would be her last meal. Stupid 13-year-old talk. She told me lemon marinade, Sep. Pie. The last few days, she lost all will to eat or drink, and I was crushed because me and my dad brought her lemon marinade pie every day. A day before she passed, she told me, where even I end up that will be our code word. If it is possible, I will tell someone that I want lemon marinade. Fast forward to when I am 24 in SeaTac Airport and this lady comes over and she explains that she is a medium and she has no idea why, but a lady wants a slice of the lemon marinade pie. I explain to her the story, she validates some other things and continues moving on her way. Crazy chills for me. Hearing this story, ants ran over the mine. It is very touching and scary at the same time. It was necessary to follow her. Maybe she's not just a person. Story 4. This one will, sort of, lift your spirits, my neighbor is retired FDN Yex Marine, injured in 911. He told us this crazy story about a mob hit that he responded to. It was the night before Thanksgiving, and they respond to an apartment fire. The fire was deemed unsafe to attempt a search and rescue, so they doused it and went in to inspect the building. They identified the source of the fire, which was an apartment doused in accelerant. In the center of the living room, two bodies, presumably a couple, were stacked on top of one another. They were shot execution style and then burned. My neighbor continues to inspect the apartment for more victims, and unfortunately he finds another tiny corpse in the kitchen sink, presumably the child of the couple, burnt beyond recognition. He loses his composure and books it outside to vomit. What kind of person murders a kid like that? He regains his composure and steps back inside, where his chief is updating the police on the situation. He hears the two victims were shot, and he interrupts, three. There were three victims. You missed the child in the kitchen sink. He was kind of choked up at this point. Silence. The EMT walks over to the sink and lets out a nervous chuckle. Charlie, you idiot! You almost gave us a heart attack! It's Thanksgiving that's their flipping turkey, you jackass. Story 5. This is the story of how I came to believe in ghosts. When I was 12, my mom dragged me and my friend along with her to a haircut. We were bored and decided to take a walk down the main street we were on and window shop. Just a few stores down there was a gap for a small parking lot. As we walk past, an elderly African-American lady waves us over to the car she's sitting in, with the door open. Being that there are the two of us and that she's clearly more feeble, we go inquire what's wrong. The lady seems a little out of it and is begging us to go across the street to another salon that her daughter owns. She's having trouble getting out of the car, see, and wants her daughter's help. She just keeps repeating, even as we're walking away to begin the task, multiple renditions of, please just get my daughter and I'm stuck in the car. We walk over and inquire to the salon. Two small, very pale girls wandering into a primarily African-American hair studio and are greeted with odd looks and silence. We get shown to the manager. She listens to our story and goes from inquisitive to white as a sheet in all of 10 seconds. We look to one another as something is obviously wrong. She starts in on us, asking all these questions, starting to grow upset. When we inquire what we did wrong and why we're not going to help her mom, she tells us this. With a nauseous look, and tears starting down her face. She says her mother just a few months before had passed away horribly when she got forced off a bridge and drowned when she couldn't get herself out of her car. We immediately run back across the street. No car, no lady. Ask the lot attendant. No, no older lady fitting that description had come through all shift. I never could question again. We thought it was a prank, but the daughter's reaction was too real and candid to be anything but the truth. 
Turns out old lady had passed away being unable to get out of her. Spooky. Story 6. This is something that happened to me. Not as scary as it is unsettling. I was living in eastern Canada in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in a very old and creaky house. After I had been living there for a while, one of my friends from the West Coast came out to visit me and check out the city. He was staying for three weeks and he had brought a lot of bags and suitcases, at least five, six bags and other bad luck like a squash racket. Don't ask me why. I told him he could sleep on the futon in the front living room. One morning after a late night of drinking, my friend bursts into my room yelling, Fire! Fire! In my hungover state, I am barely even sure of what he had said when I jumped out of bed. The floor was hot against my feet as I ran out into the hallway, right behind my friend. I couldn't see the fire anywhere. But as we ran towards the front door, I could hear the fire roaring and crackling all around me. It was inside the walls. We run out onto the front yard and look back at the house to see Blackbreath billowing out of the roof. We were standing there watching the house when I looked down and noticed all of my friend's bags and suitcases neatly lined up on the front lawn, including his squash racket. When he noticed the house was on fire, he had taken all of his luggage in at least two loads and placed it outside before coming back in to tell me about it. That fire had started in the basement where the furnace was. It spread up into the walls and was burning the entire foundation of the floor we were standing on. The entire floor and much of the house collapsed into that fiery pit not long after we had escaped. The firemen said we were very lucky to have gotten out when we did. Needless to say, we are not friends anymore. Conclusion. Friend who is staying with me notices that the house is on fire and decides to haul his five or six bags of luggage out to the sidewalk and line it up in a neat pile before coming back in to tell us sleeping me that the house is burning down. Story 7. I used to live in a suburb of Chicago in a house with a large backyard with a garden. One day when I was maybe three or four years old, my sister and I were outside playing in the back while my dad worked in the garden. This guy was walking his dog along the sidewalk by our yard, and since we were little kids, we went running to pet the dog. The guy stopped and let us play with the dog for a little bit, and then began walking again as we were playing with it. We get to the next house over, and the guy says, Do you want to come to my home and play with my dog? We say yes and start following him. When we got two houses down, we hear our dad far away yell our names, and we say, Oh, sorry, we have to go. About seven or eight years later, the Megan's Law is passed, and we find out that the man is a registered close relationship offender. Conclusion. My sister and I almost went home with a child molester, but my dad caught us right before we were out of earshot. Edit. Also, there was a guy in our neighborhood with a vanity plate that said Santa. We aren't sure it was the same guy, but we would joke about it. One night, we were playing outside, and his car pulled right up to our yard, stopped, and turned the engine lights off. He didn't get out of the car after a few minutes, and we got nervous and went inside. Story 8. My great-grandparents grew up in a small town located in the lower regions of Louisiana. Raised on a healthy diet of squirrel stew and local folktales, my grandparents were the Cajun stereotype. When my great-grandparents were first married, they lived in a small house near a cane field. Across the field, there was a Catholic church which ministered to most of the humble bayou town. My great-grandparents made it a habit to attend church during daylight hours, as it was a long walk to and from church unless they walked through the cane. Well, one night, for one reason or another, they decided to attend evening mass. They walked to church as the sun was shifting down below the visible earth. When they exited the bill lighting, it was pitch black. Fatigued from a long day of work, my grandparents decided to walk through the cane and avoid the long path. The crickets chirped as my grandparents crunched their way through the cane, one right behind the other. They could barely see through the dim moonlight, leaving them to rely on sound and touch. Working their way through the cane was tiring, and my grandfather stopped to catch his breath. My grandmother bumped into him, and they both froze. Another set of footsteps had joined theirs. They stood frozen in place, hearing the heavy thud of feet crunch against the cane. My grandfather began to slowly walk, my grandmother by his side. They were afraid to enrage the visitor. My grandmother noted its odd walking pattern. Immediately, fear ran through her. She began to run, and then the footsteps behind them grew fast-paced. My grandfather took off after her, not wanting to be caught by the visitor. After about five minutes of sprinting, they reached the end of the cane field, Thier House in sight. They quickly raced to the door, fumbling to unlock it. A shadow emerged from the cane field, walking on four legs. It begins to run at them as they manage to unlock the door. As they open it, their dog runs inside. Thier dog, Kaiser trembles as they lock the door once more. Kaiser was usually a fearless animal, and often accompanied my grandfather on his hunting trips. His bravery was gone as the door began to shake. Something was banging and scratching on the door. My grandfather assumed it was some animal. Then the doorknob began to jiggle. Somebody was turning it from the outside. Eventually it stopped. Shuffling could still be heard outside of the door. My grandfather grabbed his rifle and stood guard all night as my grandmother slept. When the sun began to rise, the noises outside ceased. 
When they opened the door, it was covered in large scratch marks. To her death, my grandmother claims that she was chased by the Rougarou, Cajun werewolf. Conclusion, my grandparents were chased through a cane field at night by an unseen creature that they believed to be a werewolf. I don't even know what to say. I was surprised by your grandfather's concern to stand guard all night to protect his wife and dog. But personally, I would not advise walking in the swamp at night. Many people do not believe in mysticism and the like. But personally, I think that all these creatures were not invented by someone just like that. Story 9. My mom used to bake bread and sell it at farmer's markets. Since we didn't have a large kitchen, she would rent space at the elementary school down the road. Baking was done after work on Thursday nights. Later is better, so the bread was fresh the next day. She would bake in the kitchen, and the rest of the school was dark and locked up. One night the phone rang, and assuming it was my dad, she picked it up. The person on the other end said, You called? She said that she didn't, and told them they must have the wrong number. Well, I was in the shower when the phone rang, so I 69 when I got out, and the call came from here. She ended up calling my dad and had him come keep her company, and she wouldn't bake alone for a while after that. Story 10 a few years ago, a friend's girlfriend at the time was driving home from seeing him. He lives in the country, and she lives in the suburbs. There was a truck next to her with a cattle trailer on it, and she looked up and saw a human female hand dangling out of one of the air slots near the top. She said she called the cops, and that they said she wasn't the first person to call about it. I don't know if it was nonsense or if it was a prank or whatever happened, but it gives me chills thinking about it. Story 11. This isn't a story I heard, but one that I experienced myself. I was seven years old, and we, my mom and sister, moved into our new house in Florida. My father had passed away the year before from complications during a triple bypass. My sister and I slept upstairs. In between our rooms was a pretty open area loft. One night I woke up sometime really late, and for some reason I got up and looked across the loft towards my sister's, and clear as day, I saw a shadow in the shape of a man. Standing at the edge of the stairs, the house was pitch black. There were no lights to cast a shadow. Being seven years old, I freaked the fudge out thinking it was a burglar, and jumped back in bed and cried myself to sleep. I woke up a short period of time later, maybe 15 to 30 minutes. I got up and checked the stairs again, and the shadow was gone. So I grabbed my little tyke's flashlight and headed downstairs towards my mom's room. Her door was cracked a little bit, so I peeked through, and I saw a shadow figure walk around my mother's bed, then bend over her. I shined my light on the floor in front of her door, and the figure juts to an upright position, seems to look at me, then turns and walks into her bathroom. I'm an atheist, and I'm not sure if I believe in spirits, but to this day, I have no explanation for what happened, other than it being my father checking up on us and then bending over to kiss my mom goodbye perhaps one last time. Just recalling and typing this out sends shivers down my spine. Story 12. Edit fixed some words. A hunter is walking through the woods, it raining and storming out, and he soon sees a cabin in the distance. He knocks a few times. No one answers, so he eventually pushes open the door and sees that that the cabin is empty save for a bed and paintings hanging all over the walls, all of them being old, faded care. Quite exhausted, he falls asleep on the bed, figuring that since no one is home, no one is going to mind if he sleeps. In the morning, he wakes, and as the sunlight streams in through every direction, he now sees that there is no pictures on the walls, only windows. Story 13. I work as a nurse. While I was training to become a nurse, a group of my friends and I were having a discussion as to whether there is some sort of an afterlife. I stated that I didn't think so, and a few of my friends disagreed. My instructor looked at me and said, Well, I used to be like you, but I have seen some strange things in the hospital that made me change my mind. She proceeded to tell us a story about a friend of hers, who was a nurse, whose daughter had terminal cancer. The daughter was in her late 20s, early 30s. She had a husband and two small children. This was a devastating situation, and she was about to pass any day. She knew this and kept telling her friends and family how afraid she was of dying. Even though she would be surrounded by her family in her last hours, she knew that she would pass away alone. Her parents were taking turns spending the night with her in the hospital room, along with her husband. It was her father's turn to go home for the evening and take care of the grandkids. She ended up dying that night, and her last words were, I'm not afraid anymore. Dad is here with me. As nurses and other health professionals can attest, people have some strange last words that may or may not mean anything. After the body had been processed and taken to the morgue, the mother went home and found her husband dead on the couch. She anticipated having one funeral, and she now had to plan for two. It was really creepy. Also, there is a ghost in my hospital of a 10-year-old little girl who was the first child to pass away in my hospital. Many patients report seeing her in a white hospital gown. Several patients have been noted to yell, Get that little girl out of here! Story 14. The summer before my sophomore year in college, I had surgery on both legs, and the recovery took way longer than expected. 
It got to the point where I had to withdraw from school in order to fully recover, so I went home for the rest of the year. Anyway, after about four months at home and my legs working, I figured I'd get a job and make some money, so I applied and got a job waiting at a popular chain restaurant. I quickly became friends with two of my fellow servers, Oscar and Louis. Oscar was a really friendly Hispanic guy, and Louis was this kid from New York with the typical cocky attitude. Anyway, fast forward another couple months, and we all head to Oscar's house to watch one of the NBA playoff games. He lives with his parents, so we make sure to introduce ourselves to them and thank them for letting us hang out there. Neither of his parents knew who we were, so we introduced ourselves. Both his mom and dad were really kind and welcomed me as I introduced myself. But when Louis introduced himself, Oscar's mom had an uneasy look on her face and asked to talk to Oscar in private. We're watching the game when Oscar comes back, and we ask what that was about, and he says not to worry about it, so we brush it off and just continue watching the game. It ends up going into overtime, but Louis can't stay for some reason or another, so he heads out, and I end up staying and watching the game with Oscar. After Louis leaves, Oscar tells me why his mom pulled him aside earlier. Apparently, she had a nightmare the night before, and in the dream, Oscar had met somebody named Luis, and nothing good came out of it. She warned him to be careful around Louis as she didn't trust him. We kind of laughed it off, but it still hung in the back of our minds. A couple weeks later, I get a call from a female co-worker of mine, crying, asking me to meet her at another mutual friend's place, so I hop in my car and head over. I meet her and Oscar at this guy's house, and she told us Louis had assaulted her the night before. Oscar and I looked at each other but said nothing. It could have been a coincidence, but I still get chills thinking about it and how Oscar's mom warned him that Louis would be trouble. Story 15. My piano teachers and close family friend, niece, Laura, was in a massive car accident with nine other college students. She was in a coma for months with her family doting on her, talking to her et cetera, et cetera. Well, there was another girl, Whitney, who passed away in the car accident and was buried and her family mourned. Well, Laura and Whitney looked a lot alike, and turns out that in the chaos of the accident, they didn't do dental records on the seriously banged up Laura when she entered the hospital. And as Laura began to emerge from the coma, she was asked to write her name and wrote Whitney Serac. Turns out they had been switched, and Laura's family had been sitting with Whitney for months while their daughter was dead and buried under another's name. And the Sereks got a phone call one day that their daughter that they had buried and mourned was alive. Look up Laura Van Ryn Whitney Serac accident. Conclusion. Two girls were switched after an accident. One was dead, the other in a coma, and the family didn't realize the mistake till months later. Story 16. This is a true story. I witnessed it firsthand, and I'm probably the most logic-driven, need-solid-proof, skeptical type of guy you'll meet. My mother always claimed that her dreams had meanings. She is about 62 and grew up in Syria, which had more than its share of myths and nonsense like that. And being the skeptic I am, never took her claim seriously and always replied with a, for every dream that somewhat comes true, there are probably hundreds that don't which human nature makes us conveniently forget. Anyway, when I was about 15, some 10 years ago, one morning just before midday, my mother came into the kitchen and was visibly shaken. She started to cry and we asked her what was wrong. She said she had a bad dream about her elderly mother, who lived in Syra and we live in Australia. She had never actually cried about a dream before. And while she claimed her dreams had meanings, she kind of went about it lightheartedly and it didn't really affect her emotionally at all. So we kind of laughed it off and said, oh, is that all? We thought something actually happened. What was the dream? She said she dreamed that her mother was holding her head with her hands like she was hurt. That's all the dream was. Simply my grandmother holding her head in her hands as if in some kind of pain. So anyway, we decided to call up overseas a bit later that afternoon and see if everything was okay, as my mother continued to feel upset and worried. We knew that grandma would be fine. We just wanted our mother to hear her voice so she would stop being sad and worried. So we call. And my uncle whom lives with my grandma answers and as expected, it turns out Granda is fine. But he said that morning, she had kind of tripped and bumped her face and eye on a cupboard, and she was a bit bruised, but otherwise she was absolutely fine. As you can imagine, we were quite surprised by this, as my mom's dream kind of had some meaning after all, and it was pretty oh no accurate. So mom speaks to grandma about all sorts of things, sees how she is, gossips, etc., and says she loves her and all that, and gets off the phone. So afterwards, my mom is still sad and continues to be worried, as if something is very wrong. We thought she would be fine after speaking to her mom and seeing that she is fine. But for some reason, my mom starts crying again, this time even worse. We reassure her and tell her it's fine. We all just spoke to grandma and saw that she's fine. So stop worrying, etc. She is silent the whole time and just weeping. Few hours go by. Mom kind of stays in her room weeping alone. Later that evening, the phone rings. My dad answers. It's my uncle. 
My granda had just passed away from a stroke, literally a few minutes ago. We go in all together to my mother's room. She looks at us, still weeping, and simply says, shakes her head and says she already knows. We all hug her. I would never have believed it if I wasn't there the entire time. Story 17. I've never told this story publicly before because I'm a journalist, and it's an effing crazy story and I need my credibility. But here it is. When I was a kid, I lived on a farm in any Ohio, near a bunch of rock mounds that were supposedly Indian burial mounds. At the time, I lived with my father and stepmother and stepbrother Kyle. He and I used to pick berries in the woods that his mother would turn into pies. One day, we were picking berries out by the mounds when we both get the feeling we're being watched. All of a sudden, something jumps out of the bushes and screams at us. Now, as I recall, it looked like a midget, dressed in filthy clothes, like a little old midget man, and I got the feeling it was trying to catch me. We dropped the bowls of berries and ran home. Flash forward 30 years. I hadn't seen Kyle in a long time because our parents got divorced over a decade ago. We got back together for our sister's birthday party. By then, I decided that the whole scary little man in the woods story was just something I had dreamt or made up or something. My wife was there and I told her, I'm going to find out for sure about this oh no story. I walked over to Kyle and said, You know, I have this weird memory I don't know if it's a dream or not, but we were picking berries. And a little man jumped out of the bushes, he said. Did a little research on this in the last year. The Indians that lived in the area had a legend of a creature known as a Pukwudji. It looked like a little man and liked to scare terminate little kids. Seriously, WTF, the smaller the creature, the more dangerous it is. It was necessary to follow him. Maybe he would show the way to their home where everything is in gold and mushrooms. Story 18. It isn't a story I heard, but it happened to me and it still creeps me out. I was driving through West Texas on my way to California and take a detour on 41 to see a friend out studying bats in Devil's Sinkhole. I stop at the only gas station for about a zillion miles to top off my tank, use the bathroom and get a snack, and it's one of those rickety old gas stations from the 70s with old pumps where you have to prepay inside. While I'm inside looking around at the snacks, I see all the bags of chips and candy bars are dusty and expired by about two years. The refrigerators holding the soda don't even sound like they're on, and it's absolutely sweltering inside, no AC. I look up out the window and see one of the only two employees there circling my car, running his fingers along the edge of the trunk. Then he reaches over and tries the driver's side door handle. I turn to the guy behind the counter and get pissed. He's trying to get into my car! He looks out at the guy now pulling on the passenger side door, looks me right in the eyes and says in a flat, matter-of-fact tone, I don't see him doing anything. Then he stoops just enough for me to see him reach under the counter for something. And that's when I felt myself click into autopilot. I flipped around and banged open the door screamed at the other guy outside to get the fudge away from my car or I'd break his face, then somehow managed to work my keys fast enough to get in and peel out before the other guy could get out the door behind me with something in his hand. I floored it for the next 50 miles freaking out because I know I looked in the rearview mirror to check if they were getting into the truck in the parking lot to follow me, but I couldn't remember what I saw because my head was swimming from the adrenaline. I called the police about 20 minutes later, and they told me since nothing had actually happened, that they weren't going to waste the gas driving out there. I still shudder when I think about how the man in the convenience store never broke eye contact with me while he was reaching under the counter. Story 19. When I was in 11th grade, my math teacher went off on a tangent about everything happening for a reason and why it is always important to be kind. At first, I was only half listening. Then things got interesting. When he was a senior in university, he decided that in his last days, he would go around to students sitting alone in the cafeteria and strike up a conversation. He approached a girl sitting alone and asked if he could have lunch with her. She seemed hesitant at first, but then agreed. They struck up a conversation and ended up talking for a while. She eventually asked him in a startled way why he came and sat with her. He explained to her that it had become his goal to sit with people he didn't know. She told him that this wasn't the first time someone had randomly asked her to have lunch with them. Apparently, when she was in high school, she was very shy and unpopular and usually spent her lunch breaks in the library. Towards the end of the year, a group of popular girls asked her to have lunch with them. She was shocked and then said no at first. They persisted and she eventually agreed. They got in one of the girls' cars and drove off school property headed to a restaurant. As they were driving down the road, dozens of cop cars whizzed past them. She went to Columbine High School. It was April 20, 1999. She escaped being in the library, where the majority of the shootings took place, because a group of girls decided to reach out to her. Story 20. I hope this doesn't get buried. I'm writing on a mobile device, forgive my mistakes. My friend Jacob told me this about a month ago. Backstory, for a little bit of context, Jacob's mother is a candy addict, and his father really didn't have much wrong with him, outside of being with his mother. One night, 
When Jacob and his father were asleep, they slept in the same room. They heard a series of loud banging, scratching, and moving noises come from the mother's room. Jacob's father jumped out of bed and ran down the hall and started slamming on the door. His mother opened it, yelling at him to quiet down and that he woke her up. He asked her about the sounds. She hadn't been awake to hear them. Jacob's dad would have assumed that she was on something again, but something was wrong. The window was open all the way and the TV was moved across the room, still plugged in, and had the screen facing outside. Jacob's dad was reasonably scared. He shut the window, got his bat, locked the mother's room from the outside and made her sleep in the living room. He stayed up most of the night. He woke up Jacob at five. It was still dark out. Jacob went out to the kitchen where his mother already was. He ate cereal. A couple minutes later, his dad walked in, wide-eyed. He pointed at Jacob and his mother and held his finger to his lips. They both quieted down. They heard something shuffling around on the roof, going from edge to edge. Jacob's dad had the bat. They sat together in the room, quiet. Minutes later, the sound went away. Jacob's grandmother was called. She was asked if everybody could stay over there for a little while. She said yes and told them she'd come pick them up. Jacob finished eating and went to go sit on the couch. There was no TV in that room, so he sat in silence. He looked over at a door to an empty room in the hallway. The door was open. There was a finger wrapped around the side of it. Jacob screamed and pointed to it, and his dad grabbed him and ran out. Jacob's mother followed behind. They went to a gas station and sat out front until they saw Jacob's grandmother's truck. Jacob described how unnatural the finger looked to me. He said it reminded him a little bit of a foam finger, in length and width. It was wrapped clear around the doorframe, the door itself being latched onto the opposite side. They didn't go back to that house much after that. Once they'd gotten everything out of it, they never went back again. Nothing was stolen, and the window in the empty room was open. Edit. Spelling, making it into paragraphs, slight information update. Paragraph format provided by you tasty brain meats. Story 21. I remember a few months back, almost a year ago, I read a user's comment about her and her younger brother. She, roughly 12 years old, and her little brother, 3 years old, were playing in the playroom, and out of nowhere the boy says to his sister, I was in mommy's tummy twice. She looked at him and shrugged it off because that's a random thing to say. But then he goes on to say, the first time, I wasn't there for long. I was sick. They came and said I had to leave mommy. I told them no, that I like it here. They said I had to go now, but that I could come back. Then the second time was much better. I wasn't sick anymore. The sister just lets him continue playing as she goes to her mom and repeats the story, and her mom starts to cry. Their mother had a miscarriage a few months before getting pregnant with the brother. The OP of this story swore it was true, and if it is, that's flipping spooky. Who are they? Story 22. The story about the man who brought his dog Sturgeon Spearing. He was inside his shanty, baiting the large hole in the ice with peeled potatoes. They sink to the bottom and attract the fish. Anyway, the man's dog jumps right in the spearing hole after the potatoes, and the current takes him under the ice. The man is heartbroken and left helpless, staring at the cold water, alone in his shanty. He exits his shanty and hears yelling and barking coming from another shanty about 40 yards away. The doors swing open and a young boy emerges with a wet dog in his arms. It is the man's dog. Story 23. Read this in NH Magazine, long but worth the read. Still gives me the chills. An AMC crew member named George was sent up in the spring with a two-way radio to assess the winter damage and report back to the crew below any special equipment that might be needed for opening the lakes of the Clouds Hut on Mount Washington. As in every winter with the north winds blowing so fiercely, the windows of the hut are boarded up tight and secure. This was just how George found them that day. By the afternoon, the men at the base signaled up to the lone hiker to see that he had made a safe arrival. Strangely, he did not answer. This didn't worry the other members of the crew at first. Maybe he had gone out for a little hike around to check on some other things. By 8 o'clock that evening, the crew tried again, and still there was no radio response from George. Anxiety rose, and the members at the base drew out a plan for an early morning exodus to the hut to check on their friend's safety. The next morning, they made their way, slow and steady, up the snow-packed trail to the hut. From all indications, George had arrived safely at the hut. His backpack and gear lay open on the dining room floor. There on a table was his two-way radio, still powered. They called out for him but couldn't find him anywhere. The searchers began looking outside for footprints. They looked in the bunk rooms with their flashlights and headlamps. The hut was eerily dark with the windows still boarded up from the harsh winter. Someone heard a noise, a whimper coming from below the kitchen sink. At last, George was found, shaking horribly and crouched under the sink with the cabinet doors closed. In his white fists, he clutched an axe and pleaded with his crewmates, Just please get me the hell out of here! Just get me out of here. Stunned by this discovery, the crew members quickly pulled him out of the cupboard. He was soaked in sweat and trembling in fear. The members begged George to tell them what was wrong, yet he would not answer them. He simply repeated, Just get me the hell out of here. 
Please! Quietly, they surrounded their friend in a secure clutch and helped him outside the hut and back onto the trail down the mountain. One crew member radioed back to the Pinkham Notch base for assistance, and an ambulance was waiting for them as soon as they reached the bottom. What terror had taken form at the hut to reduce the bravest of men into this state of unprecedented fear? No one could say. They guessed that he had run into a wild animal, maybe a wolf or bear, and had become fearful for his life. As the weeks passed and George lay recovering in the hospital, he finally opened up to a close confidant and relayed this story. After his long trek up the trail, he was overcome with exhaustion and hunger. He unlocked the heavy padlocks on the hut doors and quickly went inside into the large dining hall. There, he sat on the bench by one of the tables and began to take account of his food supplies as he rested. He thought he'd wait just a short while and catch his breath before radioing back to the base. Suddenly, he felt as if there were someone else in the dining room with him. He felt a form approach him from behind, as if someone was about to put their hands on his shoulders. He jumped up and quickly turned around to face the back of the dining hall. There, peering in at him from the dining room window, was a face. A distorted, grotesque face pressed to the glass to the dining room window panes which were entirely boarded up from the outside. George backed up in horror as he then he looked at each window pane covered by the thick boards, and there he saw one after the other, the same face, in every window, glaring back at him. The face seemed to melt through the glass and into the room where he was standing. That was the last thing George remembered. He would never return to the hut or the AMC crew again, and his since lost all memory of the trauma of the summit that changed his life forever. Story 24. In November, I purchased a house. My lease on my apartment wasn't up until December 31st, so my wife and I procrastinated until the last minute. The day prior to the end of our lease, we were packing and moving what was left in the apartment. It was quite an assortment of things, most of which needed to be thrown away, so my son and daughter were making trips to the dumpster with me while my wife packed. Our youngest daughter was barely six months old, so she sat in the living room in her car seat while the rest of us went about our tasks. It was fairly quiet as our college neighbors from down the hall were out of town, and the family that lived across from us had just left for the evening. They congratulated us on our purchase on their way out. We were making such good time cleaning I hadn't even noticed how dark it had gotten. We were focused on the various areas of the home. If only one of us hadn't been so absorbed, one of us might have noticed that my youngest daughter, who was entertaining herself the entire time, had suddenly stopped giggling. One of us might have noticed that the front door was open. But we didn't, at least not at first. My son was in the kitchen beside the living room when my infant began screaming. So naturally, he heard her first. I was already on my way before I even heard him call. My heart raced at a pace matched only by my legs, and I nearly knocked my oldest daughter over in my sprint to the living room. My wife had barely stepped out of the room a moment and rushed in just ahead of me. My daughter sat in her car seat, screaming with all the wind her little lungs would afford her. Our presence did nothing to console her. I was so concerned with her welfare that my son almost escaped my attention. Almost. Looking for my daughter's bottle, I noticed that he was the only one not crowded around her. He was the only one not looking at her. He was the only one standing completely still. I called his name and he replied in a hushed whisper. Daddy. The door is open. I assumed that one of them left it open. They were so excited to be helping that they had been flying in and out of the house with bundles of trash. Why didn't you close it? I asked him, slightly annoyed. He's a kid, I reminded myself. Kids forget things. These are things normal kids do. What would come later were things that normal kids don't do. As I went to close the door, it hit me that it was very dark. I couldn't even see the apartment lights. Not a single light from outside was shedding on the stairs leading to our door. I could only see what our living room lights illuminated, which wasn't much as we had already packed the majority of the lamps. If I had been wearing my glasses, it would not have been as much of an issue, but I was not wearing my glasses. My son is the only one of us who isn't nearsighted, so I imagine he noticed the small figure in the shadows well before I did. Our apartment was positioned at the edge of the stairs on the second floor. We weren't very close with our neighbors, but we were familiar with them. I couldn't name all of the occupants of the other two apartments sharing our floor, but I could definitely identify them. So I was somewhat surprised when the figure stepped forward and I didn't recognize it. Once my initial startle subsided, I was able to see that it was a child who approached. A young boy, no older than five, stood at my door. His hair was disheveled, he wore no shoes, and his face was unwashed. I held the door wide open, looking back at my wife caressing my screaming daughter. My wife's face showed no recognition at all. I peered out, looking for a parent as it was quite late for a child to be out alone. I started to ask him where his parents were when he abruptly spoke, I'll take the baby. His face was angled down and his eyes were looking beyond me. There was no grin, no expression. It was a blank visage framed by hair and focused on my daughter. I didn't have a chance to answer when a woman called him from down the hall. I saw no light, nor did I hear anything close in the time that I was at the door. 
This woman had not exited any apartment while I stood watch. She quickly hurried past me and told him to come. I didn't recognize her either. Story 25. I forgot the title. But there's this creepy pasta of a man who stays at a hotel with the one rule that he cannot look into the unmarked locked room on the way to his own room. He looks through the keyhole and sees a woman sitting in the corner. He thinks about knocking but decides to leave her alone. The next morning, his curiosity gets to him again, and he looks through the keyhole. However, this time all he could see was a distinct red color. He assumed the woman knew he was spying on her and covered the keyhole with red cloth. He later went to the receptionist and confronted her about the room. The receptionist explains, A woman was murdered in that room, and many guests have reported seeing her ghost. She was white all over except for her eyes. They were red. Story 26. My mom told me about this a while ago and it gave me the serious creeps. She and my dad were in a taxi coming home late one night when they realized the driver was taking a rather odd route. Assuming he either knew a shortcut or was just trying to rack up a higher number on the meter, they let it go. Until my mom noticed the slightest exchange of looks between the taxi driver and these three guys at a bus stop, who she noticed immediately got on the bus. A few minutes later, the driver suddenly turned down this dark road and told my parents that there was something wrong with the taxi. And if they just sat tight, he'd get out and check it out. My mom grabbed my dad's hand, and as soon as the driver went round the back and opened the boot of the taxi, she opened the door, dragged him out, and they both ran like crazy until they were on a street with a lot of people. Once there, she and my dad saw the bus stop, and the three guys my mom had noticed before getting off and heading in the direction of the alley they had just run out from. Conclusion Shady Peach taxi driver teamed up with creeps on a bus in some sort of plan to ambush my parents in an alley. Mom has excellent intuition. Got herself and dad the heck out of there. Story 27. This isn't nearly as good as the others, but it happened to my mom when she was young. So she was at work, my dad was at work as well. At some point, she had a feeling something was going on and instinctively called my dad. As he picked up, she realized she didn't have a reason to call him, but it seemed weird. To not embarrass herself, she just told him to come to her so they could have lunch together since my dad was out of his workplace. I think he was stopping outside for lunch. Anyway, he comes to her, they have lunch and go on with their day. In the evening, they both watch the news and there's been an explosion. At the same time they were having lunch, at the same place my dad was before my mom called her. TL Dr. Mum saves dad from dying. Story 28. Add it to. I get it, my great uncle. I, my grandmother's sister's husband, not sure what to call him, was very sick a long time ago. He was practically on his deathbed. Well, anyways, he started to get better, but he never left his bed and was in a very fragile state. They tried nursing him back and he would eventually talk more, but still couldn't move much. Anyways, my grandma told me that he was complaining about back pains, so they turned him over to give him a full scrub, and she told me he was being eaten alive by maggots. I don't know how true this is, but I don't think she'd lie to me. That dude passed away, but they didn't tell him about the maggots. Edit. Great uncle, I get it. Also, stop asking me questions about why we didn't do anything. I wasn't there, and this happened in a third world country, so yeah. Edit. Actually, my grandma, if anyone was interested, is a total badass. She lived through a war and often took care of soldiers. They'd mostly pass away on her, and she'd have to walk home a good mile at least home in the dark because there was no electricity or streetlights at the time. She had me terminate chickens once for food. Story 29. The night before my brother was supposed to be married, he was driving home on a practically empty road. He stopped at a red light, and over on his right was this really tall man dressed like an insane homeless person holding a huge styrofoam cup to collect change. There was something about him that caught my brother's eye, and he decided to give him some money. While he was reaching in his pocket to get cash, the light turned green. Just as he was pulling the money from his pocket, and three seconds into the light being green, a garbage truck ran through the light hauling Peach with two cops right on his tail, and the homeless man was gone. How could you even think of giving this strange person money? I wouldn't wait for the green light and hit the gas with all my might. Be careful. Story 30. When I was in second grade, my sister went to a sleepover. It was just the girls, and no parents were home. She is significantly older than me. Late at night, they heard a banging on the door. Not expecting anyone, they didn't answer. The banging continued, so they went to the garage and slept there. In the morning, they opened the door and there was an axe in it. To this day, she claims it was true. Another one. When I was in preschool, my parents were out and my siblings and I had a babysitter. At some point during the night, we could hear a knocking on the door. As soon as we would look out through the peephole, the knocking would stop. It continued even when my parents got home. We never figured it out, and the babysitter never came back. 